how many people here have come armed with some data that they could put into a citizen science project? I mean, if you haven't, don't worry, we can, um, you can, uh, uh, I've got something for you, but, okay, a few, cool, 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 good, 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 okay, so in this session, uh, I'm going to be posing the question, what do you want 100,000 people to do for you? I mean, this is a serious question, it's, it's, uh, uh, there's a, an amazing opportunity here for, for data mining in, and, and also sometimes data collection. Um, and I'd like you to think of this as a scientific tool rather than an outreach tool. So. Right. So, so this is the, the structure. Uh, uh, oh, this is going to be very dangerous, dimming the lights of the, the morning after a conference dinner. We are all going to be going to sleep. Is there... <laughs> I'll try and keep you awake. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking, I'll give you a, an introduction to citizen science, and then I'll give you uh, some in-depth examples. And we've got, uh, uh, from the Open University, we've got James Pearson connected as well, and he'll be giving you... Uh, 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 an up-to-date um, uh, uh, example uh, that he's working on right now. And uh, then we'll be maybe having, I don't know, a, a short comfort break, a coffee break or something, that uh, just very short though, and then going on into a hands-on thing. And there we will be using, uh, we can use Zoom chat, we can use the, the, the Slack uh, chat channel as well for uh, uh, helping you build citizen science projects. Uh, if all goes well, I think it would be really good fun. Well, I think it would be really, you, you may disagree, I don't know. Uh, I, I think it would be really good to, uh, uh, for people just to show this, uh, uh, the projects that they've created at the end of the session. Um, it, I mean, it, noting it will be just very, very, super super beta mode you're just putting knocking something together but if you're up for it it will be really interesting to to uh uh for, for everybody i think if you can just show the sort of thing that you've been trying to do um okay so i'll start off with an introduction to citizen science so this is the uh, this is an open science school uh and i only rocked up yesterday evening so i i don't know what you've been talking about. So have you heard of this uh, EOSC thing in, in your workshop? You have, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the European Open Science Cloud. And this is, you know, as you know, a huge initiative of uh, the European Union. And uh, uh, <laughs> there are many national participants in this. And the idea is to make science findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, right, fair. This is the, the headline thing that EOSC is supposed to be doing. So far, so good, okay. Um, I and mean, it's just like motherhood and apple pie. It's an aspiration you can hardly disagree with, right? But I'm gonna make a provocative statement and that making your data fair is easy, okay, compared to making fair data useful. Um, so I'll give you an example. I mean, I, I, this is provocative because uh, I've, I've, I've given this slide to roomfuls of people who have just spent their lives pouring time into making interoperability work, for example. Uh, so telling them that it's easy, you know, I'm, 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 not, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to provoke them. Um, but compared to making fair data useful, I've got an example of this. So there was an experiment to, uh, there was a claim rather to, uh, 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 it was a claim about gamma ray astronomy. And the, the idea was that uh, a, a team looked at uh, public domain uh, data from Fermi, from the uh, gamma ray telescope, and they found an excess uh, diffuse emission towards the direction of the galactic center, right? And this was really interesting because this is where the, you expect the dark matter halo cusp to be, right? So if there's gonna be dark matter halo, dark matter particle particle annihilation, you're most likely to see it where the density is higher. So, so you get a, um, uh, an excess emission 
you would expect there to be an excess emission, if anywhere, towards the galactic center. Uh, and so they made a, a, a big splash about this. And then the instrument team that uh, from Fermi themselves uh, went back and looked at this data, and this is the rebuttal paper, uh, they they uh, argued that it was in fact an observational systematic, which the, uh, uh, the, the, the this other team had not understood, right? Now, I don't want to get into the pros and cons of this particular claim, because I'm not a gamma ray astronomer, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll goof, I'm bound to goof it up. But the point is that uh, data have pitfalls, okay? And users need training. So the, the further away from your own personal subject expertise that you are, right, the more guidance you need to make good use of fair data. And this is one of the underlying tensions in the, the philosophy behind uh, 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 fair data in the European Open Science Cloud. And it's often forgotten, too often forgotten. Okay, second provocative statement. Citizen science is not outreach, okay? If there's one thing I can, I, I'd like to impress on you in this talk, it is that citizen science is not outreach. It is a tool for you for doing science. It's in astronomy, it's primarily a data mining tool uh, or labeling, characterization of, of your data. Um, uh, in other disciplines, it can be a data collection tool as well. So I mean, there are people who monitor biodiversity by uh, uh, counting lizards or trees or something in, or, or, or mushrooms in their back garden. Um, and you can't do that from remote sensing. You've got to do it from people on the ground. You know, it's it's a useful data collection tool. There's less use cases for that in astronomy because, well, and apart from maybe monitoring light pollution, Starlink satellites, that sort of thing. Uh, mostly in astronomy, it's data collection. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's data annotation, data classification. It is like a biological computer, right? Think of it like a multi-headed hydra of 100,000 brains doing science for you, okay? And so this is obviously, I've got to put a Borg picture in here, right? <laughs> I was thinking also, this is the, yeah, first, first talk after the conference dinner, don't fill this with differential equations, just make it, you know, it's just nice, easy pictures. So, um, so yes, it is it is a biological machine for doing science for you. Okay. Um, so I'd like you to imagine that you have, uh, let's say that you're not an astronomer, you're doing some uh, facial recognition problem, right? And you're looking at images of crowds and they are uh, you're you're looking for faces in crowds. And you know, there's off the off the shelf um, machine learning algorithms that will do. Uh, the, um, uh, the the facial recognition for you, right? Okay, so you could do that, and here's the data, right? So you know, you no, know, immediately a human will look at this and go, "Oh my God, there's a clown in the middle of the picture," right? Uh, and that is something that no machine learning algorithm will be able to do. Okay, so human beings interrogating data do things that machine learning are, it's you know, well beyond the capabilities of machine learning. So a uh, human being can take a step back from the problem and say, wait a minute, I, I'm, I'm, this is the wrong question to be asking. This data is telling me something weird, okay? And you know, if that's weird is something that a, a machine learning algorithm can never do. Um, and there are practical examples of this in astronomy. So there is uh, this thing, it's, um, uh, it's called Hanni's for, I, I apologize to anyone who speaks Dutch, Hanni's for verb, uh, or for verb is the singular. It's, it, it means thingy, apparently, in, in, um, uh, uh, in Dutch. So Hanni van Arkel is, uh, I think, a biology teacher, high school biology, biology teacher, and she got involved in the citizen science project uh, called Galaxy Zoo. And uh, you know, flicking through galaxies, is it a spiral? Is it elliptical? Is it clockwise? Is it anti-clockwise? Is it irregular? And blah, 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 blah. 
And she found a galaxy with a weird green splodge next to it, okay? And this very weird green splodge turns out to be, uh, it's, uh, well, it's uh, uh, green because there's O3 emission, um, 5007, 4959 angstrom emission uh, in the filter. And what you're seeing is uh, it's uh, extended narrow line region of, uh, of an AGN that is isn't that since shut down. So it's like, a, I guess you could call it a light echo of a, of a now dormant AGN. And these things are very rare. They're very transit, transitory features. But when you're interrogating very large data sets, uh, you're very good at finding rare objects. And this, you know, it's always the thing with the... Uh, 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 large data sets. It's the rare objects that really win it for you. So this, um, she, she uh, 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 flagged this to the science team as a, as a weird thingy, and the science team followed it up. And I think this is an HST uh, follow-up image of, of, of this uh, uh, for Verpi. And there, and there is a couple of dozen, maybe, of these objects in galaxies at the moment. And so this could not have been discovered by algorithmically searching through the, uh, the morphologies of, 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 of SDSS. So this is, this is science that is unique to citizen science, uh, the, the capacity for unexpected discoveries. Um, another unexpected discovery in uh, galaxies was the green pea galaxies. So these are galaxies that are, are very small, compact, uh, well, fairly resolved for SDSS, but strong in O3. So again, they, they look green. Um, these were not anticipated, um, but the volunteers flagged these as anomalies. Okay? They're called them green peas, and hence now green pea galaxies. And, and, and another key point here is that the critical thing is that the science team are interacting with the volunteers. So you don't just create a citizen science project and just let it run and then come back in three months go, oh, I've got some data now, great, woohoo, go me. No, you've got to be engaging with the volunteers because these volunteers are spending their time on something that you're telling them is important. And if you're not investing some time in it as well, then you're not gonna get some, uh, uh, well, you're not gonna get engagement from the volunteers and you're not gonna get a lot of added value. So you're, you're if you set up a citizen science project and you get it running, you need to be uh, investing time. Or to some people, you need to have science team members uh, spending time in the online forums where uh, the volunteers are discussing their classifications. Uh, now, I will say that uh, in, in uh, the, the uh, hands-on bit of this, uh, I'm, when no one's going to make you uh, uh, make these projects go live if you don't want to, right? It's, it's a technical exercise uh, when I'm not committing you like to six months work. I'd just like to see you uh, run through run through the exercise. Okay, and there's a, a, another place where citizen science is, it's uh, unique in its capabilities. And that is uh, when the, the rare objects are so rare, that it is impossible to create a training set for machine learning. So uh, this is in in Zooniverse, it's called the Zorilla problem. So yeah, I'm actually sitting in front of the screen here. So this is no good, is it? So I'm in, sitting in front of the key thing. So this thing here is uh, the, the Zorilla in the corner of the screen. So this was a, a project called Snapshot Serengeti. So this is uh, monitoring wildlife in the Serengeti um uh and you know for for reasons of biodiversity right <laughs> so it's, it's monitoring wildlife in the serengeti for reasons of biodiversity and there you then you can uh uh use that as a truth set for training machine learning uh if you if you haven't already got something off the shelf that can do this for you but there are some species that are so rare that it's impossible to create a training set and it needs humans to find these things. So this is uh, an example of one of these things. Uh, a zorilla. I have no idea what a zorilla is. I no, I I'd never even heard the word until, until I had seen this example. Okay, so broadly, 
in, in, in terms of open science, sort of dragging this back to the, the theme of, the, of this workshop, uh, the, the, the picture I'm, I, I, I'd like to present to you, or the schematic, is that you have experts interacting with open science in many ways, but the experts are leading the way for the science-inclined public to be uh, in, involved in, in open science. So um, now, uh, again, a, 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 um, uh, a hazard of me rocking up late to this conference is that I don't know how much you heard about particular technologies of open science. Have you heard about the ESCAPE project in this? Yeah, and because John Swimbank would have given a talk, right? Ah, oh, awesome, awesome, right. So, I, I, so I, uh, this will be reasonably familiar. So you have the, the, the science platform uh, that John will have talked about and um, uh, it, uh, interacting with data in the data lake. And I've got here some of the other tools and services that this project created. So you have, uh, uh, you can have uh, uh, professional scientists working with the science platforms with, uh, 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 with data in the data lake. And then from the science platform, spawning a citizen science project and then the volunteers uh, in the citizen science project uh, have the capability of jumping out, if they're particularly weird galaxies, into the virtual observatory tools, which are very accessible for non-specialists. Uh, and then you could imagine really uh, engaged people going from virtual observatory into uh, uh, the, the science platforms. Uh, but that will only be a small subset. But schematically, this is, how how uh, imagine the uh, uh, the open science ecosystem working with citizen science, and this is already the case. Yes, the volunteers jump from Galaxy Zoo into professional tools. So this is this is uh, already a, a use case that's that's up and working. So this is into uh, uh, it's not into it's not into uh, Aladdin, but it's something very like Aladdin. Um, third provocative statement, I, I will say that the, the science inclined public is the largest and most overlooked group of open science stakeholders. So I've got here an example. This is a particular citizen science project, Planet Hunters Tess. Uh, there are nearly 30,000 volunteers. The science team is 10 academics, just 10 academics fielding this gigantic team okay so there is a huge community and it's just it's an amazing appetite that people have for participating in science it's uh uh it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's uh, an unexpected secret source that uh yeah i would not have predicted so this is the only way to have two-way engagement and training of a thousand times more open science users okay. Now, I've got a, 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 a fourth provocative statement, and I was agonizing over this one. Because I and the provocative statement, it is really easy to make crap citizen science. It's really easy. And sometimes citizen science is just the wrong tool. Okay, so if you've got a bunch of data and your use cases, if you've got a bunch of data points in a 2D graph and your use cases draw a line through the data points that fits. No, don't get citizens to do that. No, just use a minimum chi-squared or least squares or something like that. For God's sake, don't use citizen science for that. It's a terrible idea. But I've seen it done. I've seen it done and it was awful. Um, so, so I agonized over this. I, I was thinking like, shall I name and shame some really, really bad citizen science projects? So and I thought, yeah, this is being recorded. So no, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> yeah, offline. <laughs> but um, uh, I will turn it around and I'll say, how do you do citizen science well? And there are a lot of really good examples of this, right? And I think I'll start off with just the first citizen science project, uh, the first big one in the, in the Zooniverse, and it was the Galaxy Zoo project. And it started off with this project, uh, well, this claim by Michael Longo in 2007. Bold idea, does the universe have a handedness? And he took of order 10,000 Sloan galaxies and classified them partly algorithmically, partly by hand. 
as either uh, anti-clockwise or clockwise spirals. Okay, and he said, oh, well, if you look at this on average, you get a dipole across the sky, therefore there's an, a net angular momentum to the, uh, at least the nearby universe, and uh, it calls into question cosmological models, blah, 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 blah. You look at that and you think, this has got to be wrong. This has just got to be wrong. So I think, well, I had, and I think probably many people had, on their whiteboards of things that would be good to do if you ever had time will be eyeball 10,000 galaxies and just check to see whether this is true because it's got to be wrong. Someone's got to do this. And, you know, I've got a day job and I, <laughs> I just don't have time to do this. And I, so I never did this. But um, the uh, team in, oh, what would it be? Chris Lintock, Kevin Schuwinski, Lucy Fortson. Um, uh, this team came up with a much better approach and that was to enlist the help of volunteers. As it's, it's not a very complicated problem, um, you know, left-handed, right-handed spirals, you can, you can crowdsource this. And they figured, that, let's do 900,000 galaxies and it would take an expert three to five years, right? Working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it's, you could imagine um, you know, two or three postdocs doing just this for three and that way a really really bad postdoc job but you could imagine that that's the volume of the task so they said let's crowdsource this that uh, they reckoned that we'd get twenty thousand, maybe oh, thirty thousand volunteers it would be all oh, be incredible if we could do that they got a hundred thousand volunteers and they made 40 million classifications it was phenomenal it was uh unanticipated just how rich the seam is for public, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying public engagement, it's public participation in scientific discovery. And it's this that makes citizen science possible across a wide range of disciplines. So how did it work? Why does it work? Well, there are a few lessons, okay? One critical question is how easy is the problem that you're asking volunteers to do? The second one is how beautiful is the problem that you're, uh, the, the data that you're, you're, you're giving to volunteers. How important is the science question? Okay, you're gonna be asking people to spend hours of their time sitting on the bus, watching TV, whatever, flicking through your data. It's got to be worth it, okay? Because you're spending a lot of people's time. Uh, so if you can't explain to them why this is, this is worth doing, then you know, <laughs> uh, you've got a problem. How much am I learning? This is something that uh, uh, the participants, participants want to feel that they're getting something out of this. <coughs> also, how famous could I get? It, could I discover a really important Earth-like exoplanet or the most distant galaxy uh, in JWST or, or whatever else? Could I become famous? Even if it's a one in a 10 million chance, uh, that's, you know, that's, that's uh, a possibility that will uh, engage volunteers. So I'll start with how easy is it, okay? So I've got an example here of uh, a Galaxy Zoo mobile app. And there we modeled it on certain other platforms where you can swipe left and swipe right. Okay, so uh, let's see if this demo plays. So this is the mobile app of uh, Zooniverse. So this was an, an early demo. And this is Hugh Dickinson here, who uh, I'll be sharing some of his results uh, soon. So you can either swipe uh, right for particular classification or slight swipe left for uh, uh, the opposite classification. This could be looking for, for example, strong gravitational lenses. So is this a lens? Yes, swipe right. Is it not a lens? Swipe left. Or is this a, a left-handed or right-handed spiral galaxy? You can swipe left or swipe right for that. Okay. Um, so this is uh, a very good way of getting a large number of very simple binary classifications. Okay, and when I uh, when we go through the um, uh, uh, the, the Zooniverse builder, you'll have, to have an option for deploying something on the mobile app. Uh, and some generic advice here. I'm just quoting you because I can, because I could buttonhole him. Uh, so pattern matching or clicking on obvious objects, or reading or transcription are your best bets for success in a citizen science project. If you are asking for something more complicated, 
more complicated. So anything more complicated will require a lot of hard work to get decent results. And I'll show you some of the hard work that got some decent results uh, uh, a bit later. But yeah, if you can keep the task simple, you will uh, you, you, you'll succeed more. So I've got here an example. This is a, a Galaxy Zoo decision tree. So these are the things that you're asking volunteers to do in Galaxy Zoo. This was a, a 2013 iteration of uh, Galaxy Zoo. It's slightly tweaked in its most uh, recent um, uh, incarnation, partly because the people involved were interested in strong gravitational lensing. And so we put the lensing question much higher up. <laughs> but um, uh, so, but you can see it's, 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 it's broken down. You're getting a pretty complicated classification here, right? You're breaking it down into a lot of small chunks. Like it starts with, is it smooth and rounded with no sign of a disc? Uh, how rounded is it? Is there anything odd? And then in the odd bits, you know, is it a polar ring galaxy? Is it a irregular galaxy? Um, this uh, symbol here for a disturbed galaxy, that turned out to be a, a, um, uh, a problem. What people ended up uh, flagging there was a bad column in the data. So uh, that was an unintended consequence there of just the way it was displayed. Um, but you can see, yeah, like how many spiral arms are there? How tightly wound is the spiral arm? And you end up from this just this, this uh, uh, Tr uh, tree of simple decisions, you end up with quite a sophisticated classification. Um, but you have to break it down into, into, these, into these chunks and it requires thought. It's a bit, it's non-trivial because you've got to put yourself in the position of somebody who doesn't know much astronomy. Um, okay, next question, how beautiful is it? And I've got an example here of something I was amazed just took off so well. It's uh, a a project called Muon Hunter. And <clears throat> the idea was to look for muon events in uh, a Cherenkov detector. So Cherenkov detectors, you're looking for a high, very high energy uh, gamma rays that uh, hit the upper atmosphere and cause a Cherenkov shower particles, right? Um, the muon events are the false positives. The muon events create uh, either ring, because they, they, they create a shower which is conical, and they hit the detectors. And then what you see is either a ring or a, a segment of a ring in your detectors. OK, so it's looking for glitchy false positives, but they, they, are, uh, they, they show up as bits of circles. But the way this was presented was to colorize the data and, uh, and looking for little colorful rings just it, it it just went on fire. I, I, I couldn't believe how, how amazingly fast this, this project took off. So we had 3,000 volunteers, and in the first five days, we got 1.3 million classifications. It was a phenomenal, it's one of the most successful Zooniverse projects that are, there have ever been, and it was just looking for glitches in data. But it was because of the way it was presented. It was beautiful and colourful, and so people could really engage with it. Okay. The next question, how important is the, uh, the question? So I've got a, an example here. It's one of my favorite um, uh, projects. It's, it was Penguin Watch. So it was a citizen science project to understand the lives of penguins in Antarctica. Okay, and it's obviously important because it tells you about uh, ecology, tells you about um, uh, climate change, it tells you uh, tells you a great many things. But it's also uh, it's beautifully simple. You're just asking the volunteers to click on the penguins and click on the eggs and click on the chicks, and that's. That's all you need to, and it's just so pretty. You're just finding the penguins and a little penguin hidden behind another penguin. It's just, it's just great. Um, uh, but it's also important. Okay. Actually, I had this dark idea. You could click on a penguin and you're going, ah! but <laughs> they didn't implement that. <laughs> um, another obviously important problem is uh, uh, transcribing weather logs 
that are over a century old. And here you've got to be, uh, you can't rely on uh, uh, character recognition um, for the transcription. You've got to go through it by hand and just uh, see that uh, uh, any transcriptions are correct. And, and sometimes you need, you need to be the person doing the transcribing. And it's obviously important for climate change, for example. So it's, it's you know, there's, there's a manifest importance to the science goals. There's another one is to look for and respond quickly to uh, natural disasters uh, with remote sensing. So uh, uh, this project Open Street Match, uh, uh, okay, it's based on the uh, damage assessment review for Open Street Map. It's called the Planetary Response Network. And so you look at very recent remote sensing uh, uh, of uh, an area for hurricane has hit an area. And then you compare it to previous remote sensing and you say, look, this area right here has been really badly hit. This is where the, the, the responders need to concentrate their efforts. And it's not something you can uh, uh, rely on an algorithm and it really helps to uh, to crowdsource this problem. You just need human eyes on the problem and it's manifestly important. And this is a curious thing is, this was a, a, a list of uh, natural disasters that, uh, this project is by uh, uh, Brooke Simmons. This is a list of natural disasters um, that uh, Relief Web was actively monitoring at the time the slide was uh, put together. And these are the volunteers of the Planetary Response Network. And there's, it's slightly weird, there's a weird anti-correlation here between uh, where the disasters are and where the, uh, the people are helping out are, anyway. Anyway, I think that this is a really good example of, of a problem that is just manifestly important, worth spending your time on. Uh, another question is, another key thing up to the success of a project is, how much am I learning? Okay. So when you create a citizen science project, you need to put in some supplementary information. So some tutorials and a field guide. So the, uh, uh, the, the volunteers know what they're looking for and can refer to the field guide uh, uh, if they get stuck and can also learn something about uh, the things that they're, uh, the data that they're interrogating. So there's an example here of um, uh, the field guide from uh, a variable star uh, citizen science project. So we've got an example here of eclipsing binaries and you've got an, uh, an explanation here of what eclipsing binaries are and why you see these uh, alternating dips. Okay, so if you want to, uh, if you've got a citizen science project idea and you want it to go live, you want to uh, uh, have a field guide that's informative and some tutorial information that's informative for the volunteers. So it does take some time. Um, this, yeah, this I, I, I'm, I've been selling this as like, hey, there's some free data for you. But no, you've got you've got to engage your time in uh, in, in engaging with the volunteers and creating the supplementary information. And the other thing, yeah, how famous could I get? This is this is a real thing, right? So um, I showed you uh, uh, Hanny's foreverb um, from earlier. Uh, this is Hanny with. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think he, the, the guy in the middle is an astronomer. He did an astronomy <laughs> on the zodiacal dust. <laughs> did a PhD on the zodiacal dust. Yeah, it's a Brian May and oh, wow. actually, I forgot the, the other guy's name. Disaster. Green. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the her discovery of, of uh, the forver it, it just took off, and. Uh, uh, Brian May is, in fact, very interested in astronomy. He, I mean, he he does genuinely have a PhD in in, in zodiacal dust, and and so uh, she connected to uh, this this wider community through through astronomy. Uh, her, she has also co-authored papers in uh, astronomy on this for Verpi and HSC follow-ups and so on. Um, and this leads to another question: is uh, in terms of how famous could I get, the things that you value as an academic in terms of fame and glittery glory are not the same as the things that the volunteers will value, okay? So for you, it could be, oh, 
co-author on a nature paper. We could dangle that. We've got this great discovery or a science paper or a, a, a phys rev letter or something. And um, they don't, uh, I mean, they might care. It depends on the project, it depends on the volunteer. They might care, but they might care more about having a name on a NASA press release or an ESA press release or something like that. So it's a non-trivial problem as to what the volunteers will value in terms of uh, uh, the sort of glittery rewards that comes out of the rare discoveries, okay. So uh, next I'm gonna show some in-depth examples uh, and then we'll go on to building your own projects. Okay, we've gone through the principles. Um, so I'm gonna show some slides on the Super Wasp Black Hole Hunter project. So these are slides I'm, I'm taking a terrible risk here. I'm showing slides by uh, uh, my colleague, Hugh Dickinson, uh, who can't be here today. Um, the, the fundamental idea here is that there should be a few hundred thousand black holes in the Milky Way, okay? And uh, we, the royal we, have only detected about 30 uh, black holes, okay, within the galaxy. So where, where are they? And the vast majority of the black holes are likely to be in binary systems, okay? So the idea is uh, uh, looking for uh, self-lensing in these binary systems, okay? So you have a black hole passing in front of a star and it's a strongly gravitationally lenses, uh, it's, it's, it's companion star, and you get a boost in brightness, a very characteristic boost in brightness. And the data here was uh, the wide angle search for planets. So this was a ground-based exoplanet search using two telescopes, in the, one in the North and Hemisphere and one in the South. Um, these cameras, by the way, they are, um, it's, it's, yeah, they, they are uh, 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 just bought off the shelf paparazzi cameras, right? They, they, they had to uh, uh, buy the lenses uh, from, from eBay just to get this thing together. But, but it, was, it was a very innovative uh, 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 instrumental setup. And the idea of the project was to monitor bright stars looking for exoplanets. But of course, uh, by in doing so, you find out a lot about variable stars, you find uh, a lot of rare objects. And this is, the, these self-lensing events are an example of the sort of rare objects that you would see. Uh, it has an eight-year cadence, uh, eight-year survey with a cadence down to 40 seconds. So that's the sort of cadence that you need to see these self-lensing events. Um, so uh, they launched this Super Wasp Black Hole Hunters project. And the volunteers are looking for things like this. So uh, this is simulated data. So you see a characteristic brightening and a symmetrical darkening afterwards. But you see also the um, inhomogeneous cadence of the data. So you see that it's, that it's very gappy, this data. So the, the white data points are the, uh, uh, the, the nightly data points and the, the, gre uh, the, 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 uh, the red squares are the averages, okay? So you expect to see a thing like this, and that's the simulated microlensing event. Um, so yes, noise and patchy cadence make it very hard to do algorithmically. So it's it's a tricky data mining problem, hard to code up, uh, but good for volunteers. Here's another example of a simulated light curve and another one even fainter. Uh, so, and gosh, an even fainter one there. But the real, here's some real data. Oh my God, what a mess. There's not much there um, or there uh, or there. It's very hard. So you are people are trawling through a lot of really grotty data, but finding black holes, you know, <laughs> let's, let's do this. Yeah. Uh, they have uh, uh, engaged five and a half thousand volunteers and inspected 200, over 200,000 light curves. And the total number of classifications is over 2 million. So you notice the different, the factor of 10 difference there. So you want light curves, you want data in general, you want your data to be classified multiple times by volunteers. Factor of 10 is a reasonable number um, as, a, as a just a starting point heuristic. Uh, because firstly, that allows you to know how robust the classifications are, how repeatable the classifications are. Secondly, it also gives you a handle on how um, uh, 
uh, reliable the volunteers are. So the, some volunteers will be very engaged and very accurate in, in, uh, in their uh, classification, some not so much because, uh, I mean, because there will always be a natural variation. Um, so here, for example, is uh, this is the x axis is the probability that uh, a volunteer clicks true given it's true, and the volunteer uh, y axis is the, the probability the volunteer clicks it's not uh, given that it truly isn't. So this is using simulated data to classify uh, the accuracies. And you can see most of the volunteers are uh, clustered in the top right hand corner. If you had a volunteer right at the bottom here, it would mean that they're almost always wrong, but that would be really useful, right? You just flip the score, right? So there's 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 a lot of useful information in, 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 in characterizing uh, volunteers like this, and you can deploy that in running your citizen science projects. So here are some examples that they've seen. There was uh, this guy and this guy, maybe. This one looks really, Interesting, and it turned out it was uh, Myra variable, so no, <laughs> nil point. And it was a, a little bit asymmetrical, so it, it couldn't be a lending event. Um, so they've created a vetting algorithm. Uh, and one important step here is the second step here uh, is to use the tags in the talk forum. So this is uh, making scientific use of the volunteer engagement, the sort of free form volunteer engagement in the forums, okay? So, uh, I mean, it's not just me exhorting to you how useful it is for, for science scientists to engage with uh, uh, the volunteers. You, you can make it an algorithmic part of your data analysis. Uh, the an analysis is ongoing and watch this space, I will just say for that. Um, the second project I want to talk about is Galaxy Zoo Clump Scout, okay. So uh, I've got here an image of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, okay. Very famous image, one of the most famous images in astronomy, I would say. Well, better than I would, because I'm like blob count. <laughs> um, uh, you, you think of uh, uh, galaxies, you think of generally, your, the, the image in your mind is a, a probably a grand design spiral like, like this. Um, but in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, you find lots of weird blobby monsters, uh, lots of clumpy galaxies in particular. And this clumpiness is a uh, 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 is telling you something about the uh, evolution of star formation. And you also see clumpy galaxies in strongly lens systems. Um, uh, when you deproject onto back onto the source plane, you find uh, there's uh, lots of resolved clumps in them. Um, uh, and background galaxies from uh, strong in, that have been strongly gravitationally lens. And this is a uh, classic famous um, strongly lensing galaxy cluster uh, seen by J.W. Resting. So why, why are clumpy galaxies important? Uh, well, there's a, a, a phenomenological co a correlation with uh, the, uh, the cosmic star formation history. Uh, so you have many clumpy galaxies at cosmic noon and a uh, few galaxies, a few clumpy galaxies uh, as you approach the present day. Um, and we have here some uh, uh, plots of the fraction of clumpy galaxies as a function of redshift. So the data stops at about redshift of 0.7, okay? And that sounds like, well, you've gone really nearly all the way from redshift three to redshift 0.7, okay? This, but this gap there, is a in cosmic time is about seven billion years, right? So we're very used to thinking of redshift as just like a linear axis, but in fact, it's a very non-linear function of cosmic time. Um, so the the project is to find more nearby clumpy galaxies. Now you can do this in three ways. You could do it automatically, algorithmically, with a clump finding algorithm, uh, which is fast but also inflexible. Uh, or you could use, you could do it by hand or with citizen science, which is flexible, but is much, well, I'll say slow, but it's in, in inverted commas, but it, it, it's, it's, it's slower than an automatic algorithm. And then there's deep learning, right? So which is both fast and flexible, but for which you need a, a training set. So I'll just focus here for now on the, uh, the manual citizen science uh, 
uh, uh, use case. So here, the objective is to click on clumps in uh, galaxies. So, so, so it's a, ostensibly a, a, a simple annotation right, problem of just uh, where are the clumps in these clumpy galaxies? Um, it got a lot of traction, uh, uh, 15,000 volunteers with 80,000 galaxies in inspected. Then uh, came to the problem of analyzing the data. And it turns out that pretty much nobody reads the tutorials you write. So you make these beautiful, intricate learning packages to, to show people what it is, what they're looking for, and what the, the um, and, uh, 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 what, it, what it all means, um, uh, what's this underlying science, and no one, they just want to get in there and go click, 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 right. So eventually they don't, right? It's a, so, so it's not a wasted effort, and you've got to do, you've got to provide the, uh, 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 the field guide, you've got to provide the tutorial information, but you've got to bear in mind that there will always be a bunch of people who just want to get going and start clicking, right? And there will be a bunch of 13 year old children who will, if they can click on an image and draw a picture of something, you can guarantee they will absolutely do that, right? So there's going to be that in your data set as well. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, really? Oh, I hate people. <laughs> So, uh, so I've got an example here of uh, Clumpy Galaxy. So what you would like to find is some uh, 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 clumps that uh, an expert would find. Okay, so these are possible clumps found by an expert. So we would love the volunteers to just come up with these so you can run a clustering algorithm and aggregate the results. And this was the idea of the project. It's a simple project. It's, it's not complicated. It should be easy to aggregate the results. Uh, and then the data came in and, oh my God, oh my God, it's, this is going to be a hard problem. What on earth do we do with this? So, uh, Hugh wrote an algorithm to, uh, find the consensus, uh, uh, clumps in the data set. So I've got it schematically here for, uh, how non-consensus clumps are rejected and consensus clumps are accepted and there is a mathematical formalism to this and oh my god it's 10 o'clock in the morning after uh, after the conference dinner and no i am not going to show this to you because there, there is a paper here if you would like to uh, if you would like to read it so and, and and the software is 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 on github so so this is this is available to you off the shelf should you want to use it anyway uh, three and a half million clicks needed to be uh, uh uh, uh aggregated so before the aggregator algorithm you get a thing like this and afterwards you get a thing like this so broadly yeah it works it, it, it finds the clumps you would expect it to find um 35 000 clumpy galaxies and 100 000 potential clumps and the first catalog paper has uh, just recently been released and the result is you find a very steep decline, startlingly steep decline in the fraction of clumpy galaxies. And so the fraction of clumpy galaxies has dropped dramatically. So what is causing this? Physically, what is causing this? Uh, if, you, if you're thinking maybe it's extrinsic factors that are creating the clumpy galaxies, so if it's minor mergers, that would not tend to follow a pattern like this because the minor merger uh, uh, evolution uh, doesn't look like that, okay? It looks like these gray tracks. But it is consistent to uh, the turbulent fraction of galaxies. So these are the orange data points here. So it suggests that this in situ formation of the clumps in the galaxy, which is, you know, it's, it's a, a uh, result of, of a fundamental importance for a star formation in galaxies and stellar matter assembly. So then you've got a training set. So you can now think, well, let's let's try and roll this out to um, uh, uh, with a, an off-the-shelf machine learning algorithm. So you've got a few thousand, few tens of thousands of galaxies, use citizen science, use it as training data, and then deploy deep learning. And that's the idea which is fast and flexible, and you can, you can deploy this to a few million galaxies. Um, in the hands-on session, I'll be getting you to, to create a citizen science project by hand, but in the Slack, 
I will put a GitLab link to some um, uh, notebooks and Jupyter notebooks where you can uh, manage projects from without doing, going through the website, but do it entirely from Python and uh, 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 implement um, algorithmic subject retirement, which means something's been classified well enough and you can just uh, drop it out of the of, of, uh, the set for the volunteers and then implement uh, machine learning as well. So, um, well, that's too much for uh, uh, the morning after a conference dinner. So I'll, I'll just give you the link, okay? Um, so a generic deep learning model finds four times as many clumps as the clump scout volunteers. Okay, this was uh, uh, but this was quite a surprise here. So all the data here is test data and unseen by the machine learning algorithms. Um, so the white dots here are the volunteer clicks and the green boxes are the ag aggregated volunteer clumps and the red boxes are additional machine learning clumps. Okay, that one, yeah, I guess, yeah, that's a clump. Uh, another one uh, here, you can see the volunteers have focused in on those uh, those um, uh, uh, clumps on the north west. I always get muddled about uh, I, uh, every time I look at the sky and every time I look at the map, I think which way is east this time? I oh, can't, I forget. <laughs> um, uh, another example here. So the the red uh, the machine learning is is finding clumps that are uh, less blue than the um, uh, the volunteers were finding. Uh, and here, are, uh, another uh, example. Now, it turns out that the number of clumps has increased a lot, but the fraction of clumpy galaxies does not change. So the, si the fundamental science result of a precipitous drop in the, uh, the fraction of clumpy galaxies remains the, uh, the case uh, once you've deployed machine learning and, and algorithmically rolled it out to a much larger sample. So in summary there, we have uh, 15,000 volunteers, 80,000 galaxies, 35,000 clumpy galaxies, and 100,000 clumps. Two papers are out. First catalog re is released. Uh, there's a machine le learning model that's trained and another paper in preparation. And what I would like to now do is hand over to James, who will talk about a, a project that's uh, hot off the press. It's the Galaxy Zoo Cosmic Dawn. So, James, are you there? This is fingers crossed. <laughs> is this going to work? Hello. Hello. Is that coming through all right, sound wise? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll share my screen. Uh, I think that should have worked. <laughs> Uh, is that right? I can't, I can't see the uh, slide behind you, so. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, yes, uh, as Stephen mentioned, I'm James, and I've been working alongside Stephen and Hugh Dickinson at the Open University, um, as well as the Galaxy Zoo team. Uh, and I've been working with them leading a uh, Rubin LSST and Euclid Precursor Citizen Science Project, Galaxy Zoo Cosmic Dawn. And so this is the latest iteration of Galaxy Zoo, which is the longest running and most popular project on the Zooniverse citizen science platform. So as a background, obviously there's the a core aim of extra galactic astronomy is to study how ga galaxies form and evolve over cosmic time. Uh, they come in a variety of shapes from more like ellipticals to those with grand spiral arms. There's plenty for volunteers to be interested in looking at. Um, and to study how galaxies evolve requires a large number of classified galaxies. And so this is where volunteers come in. They can play a crucial role in the examination of these huge data sets that we're getting nowadays. So Zooniverse is the world's largest and most popular platform for people-powered research. That's what we'll be looking at today. Um, and it's made possible by volunteers, more than a million uh, people around the world who come together to assist professional researchers. And this gives the public the opportunity to contribute meaningfully to scientific discovery, while on the sidelines also helping to inspire the next generation of students and scientists. So Galaxy Zoo 
uh, asks volunteers to classify images of galaxies based on their visual appearance. So it's gone through multiple iterations over its 15 year lifespan um, with volunteers asked a number of questions through a decision tree. So uh, things like, is it smooth or featured? Is there a spiral arm pattern? How tightly wound are the spiral arms? How many are there? Is there a central bulge? Is the galaxy merging with another? Or are there any rare features such as gravitational lensing arts? Uh, and this new iteration, uh, Cosmic Dawn, is focusing on uh, hyper-suprime cam imaging on board the Subaru telescope, pictured on the right here, uh, located on the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, as part of the Hawaii 2O or H2O Cosmic Dawn survey. This survey is 50 square degrees, multi-wavelength survey of some of the darkest fields on the sky. Uh, so the scientific aim is to understand the co-evolution between galaxies, uh, black holes, and the dark matter halos that host them over cosmic time. So one facet of this is the H2O survey, which focuses on the two primary Euclid deep calibration fields, including the Euclid deep field north, which is and it's aiming to push the boundaries of extragalactic astronomy by studying galaxy evolution out to high redshift, sort of redshift of seven or so. So coming back to the Galaxy Zoo project, we're presenting volunteers with many tens of thousands of these deep H2O imaging, uh, images of the 10 square degree Euclid deep field north. It says uh, a number of benefits. So because we have, um, once it's finished, it'll have a, a large group of classified images that are multiband um, imaging. This provides the ground truth set that we can use for, say, LSST, Rubin. Um, and because we're focusing on the Euclid Deep Field North, it also acts as a precursor for the Euclid survey through providing initial classifications that could be used for rapid follow-up imaging of the more interesting things. Um, and, and as well as this, because it's a higher end uh, resolution over an, an intensely studied area, and because we have deep multiband imaging, this allows for studying both high redshift sources and low surface brightness features, more so than any previous iteration of Galaxy Zoo. And of course, because we're using volunteers rather than machine learning, as Stephen has mentioned before, um, we can expand the list of interesting objects such as Hanny's Wolf 4 uh, through serendip serendipitous discovery. And so as well as these benefits, uh, when you finish your when you finish your project, um, you likely have a number of publications. So for Galaxy Zoo, we always have a general data release paper um, to sort of inform the scientific community of all of the uh, classifications that have been made. And there will also be a number of uh, more focused papers. So, for example, a paper on any uh, strong gravitational lenses that we find, any uh, statistics on clumpy galaxies. Uh, for the, the reasons mentioned um, by Stephen, as well as other things like looking at low surface brightness features that we can do with this project in particular, and a number of other cases as well. But uh, when designing a citizen science project, um, it's very important to carefully consider both the science goals as well as the experience for volunteers to actually keep them engaged long enough for you to get the classifications you need. So, uh, as I mentioned, the HSC data for Cosmic Dawn is deeper than usual for Galaxy Zoo. So to ensure the best possible experience for volunteers, we made sure to take the time to implement new color scaling and image scaling codes. So the images are generated, like the one here, centered on the galaxy of an appropriate size and colors that the volunteers are used to seeing. Um, as well as this, we focus for the sort of science goals point of view, we updated the decision tree of questions to include a question on clumpy features so that we can study how populations of these clumpy galaxies vary with redshift. Uh, we placed an emphasis on uh, identifying gravitational lenses due to their rarity by shifting up the importance of the lens question. Um, and to aid the, H2, the H2O team improve their own data reduction and modeling pipeline, 
we also expanded the question uh, that we have on problem images. If volunteer spots, spots a problem with an image, they can say it's typ typically it would just be a star or an artifact. We also added a bad zoom image uh, option, um, as well as expanding the artifact option to include what type of artifact. Um, and this obviously sounds quite complicated for a volunteer to do, but that's where the field guide comes in, as Stephen mentioned. Um, that can help volunteers understand the different types. Um, and also have, making sure another easy thing to do is having these little images next to the question, next to the, uh, the different responses, so that volunteers can very easily just remember what each thing is. So uh, Galaxy Zoo Cosmic Dawn had its public launch back in October of last year, which was accompanied by a blog post written by the telescope team. We thought that was very important, both for publicizing the project, uh, but also uh, volunteers, when it, for at least for astronomy projects, getting the survey team, the telescope team, actually involved with the volunteers, um, I think it tends to make volunteers more engaged rather than it just being volunteers and the core Zooniverse team. It means it feels like they have, there's a stronger connection to the astronomy side of things. Uh, so since then, there has been over 1.1 million classifications made by many tens of thousands of volunteers. Um, and with the project coming towards an end now, um, we've also deployed Galaxy Zoo's own deep learning code uh, called Zoobot, which uh, through training on these classifications can actually predict volunteer classifications for a vast array of galaxy properties. So this helps speed up the classification process while simultaneously improving the experience of volunteers through leaving them with the more interesting, difficult to classify subjects that uh, the machine learning can't handle. So yes, the project's coming to a close, so feel free to join in if you want. Thank you for listening. And I should mention that yeah, Zoobots is one, incorporate, incorporating machine learning is one of the many things that can be done through Zooniverse's Python package as a whole backend package that can be used. But today, I think we'll be just be focusing on the, the basics of creating a project through Zooniverse's own web interface. Uh, and with that, I'll pass back to Stephen. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let me see if I can share the screen. There we go. Boom. There. So uh, the next thing is build your own projects. But now, so now it's what ten past ten past ten, and we've been in a darkened room um, the morning after the conference dinner uh, for a long time. Do we want to like a, 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 a two minute coffee comfort break before pressing? Yeah, let's do that. Let's. Short break, short break, short break. All right. Uh, well, let's let's see. Uh, are, uh, are there any questions at this point before we just have a quick break? No, it's still far too much. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah. So the it's it's wonderful all the all mm -hmm. nice work on citizen science. It, how to get the word out? Um, so like well, Zooniverse I guess has its own set of uh, volunteers that mm -hmm. are already registered, and I guess each new project gets announced uh, everywhere. But then um, you need to have a good uh, um, let's say um, outreach yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, of the of the project. Yeah. To, uh, so how do you do that? Uh, okay. what, what's the best strategies to to get the word out? That that, you want that's a really good question. So um, there, are, there are two ways you can use the Zooniverse platform. One is it's just a standalone platform. It's like a wiki. You can do whatever you like on it and you can do your own publicity. Fine. Whatever. Right. Um, uh because the technology is there it's even it's open source you could you could uh run your own instance if you really wanted to of, of the panoptes client um uh but zooniverse as an organization uh they uh, uh adopt particular citizen science projects so if you've got a project that you think could be an official zooniverse project 
um, then you can pitch it to them. And if they like it, they, they put it into a beta phase where they have some very experienced volunteers who then give you feedback, peer review feedback on the project. And, and then you tweak the project and all being well, it can then go live as a, a official Zooniverse project. And then they have their, a whole publicity machine behind it, their own mailing lists and so on. And there are, um, there are people who, who wait for news of new citizen science projects and jump on them. And they get a bit annoyed if a project ends too quickly because they want to do every single citizen science project, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the Zooniverse uh, um, uh, uh, run. Now, if you would like a project to be an official uh, uh, Zooniverse project, following the guidelines in this talk would be a, a, a pretty good uh, way of, of of meeting their benchmarks. So, I would I would say make a great project and uh, and then pitch for it to be uh, 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 an official Zooniverse project. And they love good ideas and they love promoting good ideas. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for all this. Oh. Michael, <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you for for this uh, very. Very refreshing <laughs> talk and and style. Uh, I I know you want to do provocative statements, mm -hmm. but um, do you really think that this is not uh, an outreach activity? Okay. And let me finish the question okay. because I think we have the the duty to. Um, so this is very useful mm -hmm. to train the citizens in a science mm -hmm. mind, which is more and more important, unfortunately, <laughs> because I think we were in the, the right track, but, but then it happens that we go back to the earth is, is uh, flat and so, so on. So shouldn't this be, these projects make sure that they are two arrow projects because you won't really use them to train people and, and know what is the basics of the scientific method? That's question one mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll make the second the second one and the second one is you said we were trying to find clumps and the expert said these are the clumps mm -hmm. and then the citizens said those so oh my god this is wrong but we know what happened with the green mm -hmm. so is this really do we, we really want to bias the citizens to find what we want to find Ah, right. Okay. Do so, we want to take advantage that they don't have any bias as astronomers or scientists have? That's that's my two provocative questions. Two really good questions. Yeah. I would say in, in, in response to the first one, uh, you are right that there is um we are we have a problem in science communication at the moment because of a big volume of uh targeted intentional disinformation on multiple fronts um, and a disinclination to uh, believe expertise, scientific expertise in on multiple fronts. And so there, it, it's a fundamental problem for science communication. Uh, if your objective is science communication, okay, I would say that your first starting point should not be citizen science. And I spent the whole morning saying, you should do citizen science, it's wonderful. But uh, there are a lot of times where you think this is actually not the right solution. Collateral result. It can be not a goal, Not the goal, but um, collateral result that should go always with the citizen science projects, in my opinion. Your target is to do the science, but it's like our duty with the, with society. We may, should make sure that the citizen science project at the same time fulfills that everyone doing this project learns what the scientific method is. Yes, and I think that that is very important. And because, because what you're tapping into is a desire, a public desire to participate in scientific discovery. And that means showing what scientific discovery is and showing volunteers that it's okay to uh, to click on something and it's wrong. Uh, because sometimes volunteers are very nervous about, oh, what if I click and I make a mistake? Oh, will I spoil that? Will I spoil everything? Oh, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's about, well, you can't say the central limit theorem, but, <laughs> but you express uh, something uh, 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 
along those lines. So uh, if yes, so, so if, if you want the public to participate in science, they need to understand how science works pragmatically. And sometimes, I mean, when you uh, think of science, how it's the, the structure of science is taught in schools, I would guess, you think here is the hypothesis. Is it A or is it B? We will do an experiment and we discover that B is favored and A is ruled out at this significance level, conclusion, blah, blah, blah. It almost never happens like that, never. You look at, you get a bunch of data and you think, oh, that's weird. That's weird. Well, why, why is it doing that? Let's, what's this data trying to tell me? And then you think, well, if it's, if it's caused by this, well, then maybe, maybe we, uh, if we try that, that would, that would, that would not work. So let's see if it works. And, you know, you, you're messing around. It's much more informal. So it's the informality of scientific discovery, I think, does need communication. And that, and citizen science can be a vehicle for that. Um, but uh, if your primary objective is communication, if your primary objective is how does science work, I would say your starting point should be something that is not citizen science. It, it should be, I don't know, lectures or, uh, or, or TV shows or something. Um, there are much more effective channels for achieving that objective. If your objective is teaching, teach. Put your resource into teaching. Don't put your resource into something which does teaching as an assigned, um, because it's not as effective. And it's tempting because you know you can get some data, you can get get your your, your objects classified, but it's it's um, and it, it also does the science a disservice if if you're if if you do that because then people look at the science that you've done and go oh but it's outreach though isn't it no yeah I can see you've written three papers but you know it's still outreach though isn't it no no it's not outreach so th th there's a danger uh, uh, there. Um, yeah, so uh, as for your second question, um, yeah, that's a, a deep, wide-ranging question. Um, and it's a question that I, uh, I guess is best answered by uh, the good practice in designing a project. So you want to and give volunteers the option to jump out and say, this is weird for some reason. This is, you've asked me to find green things and there's a big blue thing in the middle. Is this supposed to be like that? Um, so you, your decision tree needs an option to go, huh? okay. Um, also, uh, it's, it's an essential part of the process to have a forum where the, the, the volunteers can tag particular subjects and then bring them to the attention of the science teams and then discuss them. So uh, yeah, you, absolutely have to consciously build in the possibility of the unexpected there are uh yeah and now i'm thinking of donald runsfeld it's probably unhelpful yes <laughs> uh other questions yeah yeah i don't know maybe crazy question uh you mentioned uh Something about uh, you know kids messing around with uh, with the data. Oh God, yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, to avoid that or to minimize that, uh, do you do you implement like some sort of filters uh, in the system where you you can filter your citizens? I don't know before they they can uh, play around with the data or. Um, that's a good question. I, Galaxy Zoo, sorry, uh, Zooniverse, I, I think as the policy doesn't take demographic data on its on, on its volunteers. The only way you can get that is if there's, for example, a Facebook group and they're uh, uh, supporting the project and then that you, you can pull out some demographic data. So you can't rule out the uh, 13 year olds, teenage boys who just want to uh, draw bad things on your data. Um, you can pick them out by the uh, the number of uh, by putting in simulated features in the data and seeing whether they correctly identify them or don't, and how often they don't, and then they will be featured as uh, bad classifiers. And honestly, I suspect 
that after doing it five times, you'll get bored of it. So you're not going to get a large volunteer. A volunteer is not going to just uh, spike your entire data set like that. But you're right. Um, I mean, the broader problem is that a lot of the classifications will be low noise. Is uh, sorry, low signal to noise. So it, it's uh, fundamentally the problem of aggregating the data is a problem of pulling out the uh, uh, features in in a large amount of low signal to noise data, and that depends on exactly what the the question is that you're asking. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Okay, we have a question through a Slack from. Ah. Teresa Figert, uh, our colleague. Oh. Uh -huh. So Teresa, can, if you want, you can ask to, to Zoom. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. OK, perfect. Uh, I was actually wondering what happens with, when there is initial interest and there may be a lot of users. So how does one deal with potential loss of news value? Um, you might lose the sense of urgency and interest and simply forget to working on it. And I'm saying this as, as a former volunteer in in, a, in another project, non-astronomy. And uh, at first I thought it was cool and then I just lost interest and dropped off. Or is this not a, an issue as long as you get enough, uh, a large enough number of users? That's a really good question. And yes, uh, there's... you. Uh as I understand it, a pulse of activity when a project is launched and it will die off unless there's, uh, 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 it, it's, it's chivied by the, um, uh, kept up by uh, Zooniverse publicity. Um, a curious thing in uh, is that a, the data that you get will be dominated by a small number of volunteers who are incredibly committed to the project. Um, uh, and the, uh, I mean, it could be a, a third of your data is supplied by a 10% of your volunteers or even a bigger disparity than that. So there will be a very committed set of uh, volunteers who, who contribute an amazing amount of work. Uh, and to me, that's, that's just staggering that people just had this huge appetite to participate. Um, uh, and there will be a, a large number of volunteers who just dive in and then just do a bit and then go, nah, I'm going to do a different thing now. And there is a lot of different things to do in, in, in citizen science. So it's, 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 it's a serious temptation. So you could choose to uh, differ, diversify your interests. Um, so I would say sometimes projects do need re-upping and they, and they, and they don't, uh, maybe the, the, the science team are a bit too ambitious and how much can be achieved uh, by, um, by volunteers. Uh, but for the most part, stuff gets mocked up, and it gets mocked up by a surprisingly small number of volunteers. There isn't really a generic answer to your question, but you raise a really good point that uh, uh, to be aware that uh, as, as people designing citizen science projects, that, um, uh, uh, that there will be a, a large group of volunteers who just dip their toe in. Um, I, can I ask uh, which project it was, if you don't mind me asking, um, that you, you dived into? This was not a Galaxy Zoo project. Uh, this was uh, mapping uh, areas in, in uh, non-populated countries. So <laughs> it was quite different, but uh, interesting to start with. And so I, I have a follow-up question. Do you, would you normally put a time limit on you? Uh, uh, you would expect to get so and so many results after a certain amount of time. Uh, I mean, how long can a project go on for? How long has, uh, uh, yeah, generally. That's a good question. And there is no limit, <clears throat> no, no limit at all for how long a project can go on for. Um, there are some projects where there's, uh, like, for example, Galaxy Zoo, where there is a lot of data and you just queue up each iteration of Galaxy Zoo and, and people chomp through it really quickly. So the Galaxy Zoo Cosmic Dawn was the latest iter iteration. There'll be a Galaxy Zoo, I think a Galaxy Zoo Hypersuit Prime Cam afterwards, and then a Galaxy Zoo JWST after that. And before that, there was a Galaxy Zoo Hubble Space Telescope Cosmos. And before that, was Galaxy Zoo Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And so, so those ones, because you've got a particular brand where you're just kind of feeding the next iteration one after the other, then they will be time limited. But for uh, for super wasp variable stars or black hole hunters, the, the thing that sets the time limit is when you run out of data. Uh, uh, that, that's 
sets the uh, uh, the natural time scale uh, rather than the um, uh, any anything built into the platform or uh, the, or into the sociology of volunteers. But yeah, it's a good question. There's another question here. No, just a thumbs up. Thank you. Okay. There was a question at the back of the room. Yeah. Oh, uh, and another one here. Yes. Yes. Uh, I think I have one last question. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, you, you say that uh, citizen science is not outreach, uh, it's science, mm -hmm. but uh, do you consider it uh, education? Uh, what about engaged teachers or students at different levels? levels? Is mm -hmm. it a good idea? Or? Well, I would say it's, it's a secondary benefit. It's a real benefit, um, but it's not a good reason on its own for building a citizen science project. You, I mean, if only because you're gonna be getting tens or hundreds of thousands of people to do something for you and it better be worthwhile because uh, you don't want to waste their time. So uh, that they will learn things in the course of doing it. They, uh, there, there is, there was a, a uh, a study, the Longitudinal Study of American Youth. It was, it's a long, long-term project. Um, it now has a different name, I've forgotten it. But uh, they show that if you have a, a bit of exposure to science at an early stage, uh, then that has a long-lasting benefit to your approach and attitude to science, lifelong. Um, so it can help. Um, I would still think that the I would still argue that the the most effective way to do education and training is to specifically start with education and training. It is a necessary part of the, having a successful pro, uh, data mining project. You need to have some component of education and training to help people along. But a lot of people will just want to dive in and start clicking as well. So. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, the, the education and training has not succeeded for them. So uh, if your goal is education and training, I would say don't do something where you know that a bunch of people are just going to ignore it. I would, I would say focus on it. But, but, but for sure, it's, 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 a, it's a fabulous secondary benefit. Yeah. Okay, um, let's take one last question before we move on. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, with the machine learning now uh, getting more and more sophisticated, uh, do you think that this can eventually be replaced by uh, machine learning or what, what's your that's expectation a, on that? That's a great question. Um, uh, and one that crops up. Uh, I, I've given talks on, on, on um, citizen science for oh, about the last five, six, seven years, uh, often somebody at the end will say, yeah, but what about machine learning? And it, and, uh, and back seven years ago, I was saying, well, you know, we're not there yet. It, uh, there's, there's things that humans can do that, that machine learning can't. Now, since then, my goodness, um, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot more. So some of the, some of the, uh, uh, the uh, the citizen science projects I've shown are now better done by machine learning. So uh, our off-the-shelf algorithms would be good for the peng penguin hunting project, for example. Um, uh, on the other hand, there are still things that humans uh, can uniquely do and foreseeably can only uniquely do. And that is to take a step back and say this is this you're asking the wrong question the data's telling you something else there's a clown in the picture right you need to be able to step outside and also sometimes the objects you're looking for are so rare that you can't compile a training set for training the deep learning so uh in those cases you still need a human um when when you're raking through data that is it's just too sparse for machine learning so so there's still uh i I guess if someone ever seri can seriously talk about uh, artificial general intelligence, then yes, we might be having a different conversation, but we're such a long way away from that, I think, that uh, uh, I think there's still a, a lot of room for, uh, for volunteers. But it's a really good question, though, a really perfect question. 
I know the discussion is interesting, <laughs> but we still have a way to go. So um, can we keep the rest of the questions to after the second part, if that's OK? OK. Yeah, thank you. So we have 40, well, God, cry, we got 30 minutes. <gasps> right. And I did say I, I give people a, uh, like a five minute comfort break. Do people want a five minute comfort break? No one's, I guess everyone can just like walk out if they want it. <laughs> so, you know, it's just not a problem. So, uh, okay. So I will show, I, I recorded, let's see if I can get this to work. Right, so what you will need is a Zooniverse.org login. I'm gonna take a, a show of hands. Have people set up a Zooniverse login for themselves? A very small number, a few people have. Okay, all right. So it's very easy. Um, so that is that is the first thing that uh, you will need to do. Then uh, the second thing, you need is some data. So uh, I put a message out saying the sort of the formats of the data, are images, PNGs, JPEGs, that sort of thing uh, be uh, uh, good. If it's pretty, even better. Um, if you don't have your own data prepared, I've got a link here to uh, uh, data at uh, uh, this URL. It's a, it links to uh, Dropbox, where I've, bun I've put a bunch of images. Also, I've got um, uh, a GitHub repo with some uh, uh, some data. So github.com slash Stephen Sargent with my horrific pathological spelling um, and slash muffins. So that's that's the data. Okay. So I'm sure everyone now is rapidly going to tap that, 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 that. Download it. It will copy and put it in the Slack. Oh, that would be awesome. Okay, thanks. Sure, 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 sure. So, yeah. So I've got that. I've got that. So, so the demonstration project will ask users if these images are chihuahuas or muffins. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, it's surprisingly tricky. So this was um, this was actually one of the classic machine learning challenges. Uh, uh, so so I, I'm showing you data which has. I, you asked a really good question. Where is is this a good niche for machine learning? But this is something that machine learning actually does quite well as well. That, um, but uh, it's a it's a useful demonstration. So you will need to create. Uh, a simple uh, uh, CSV file, manifest.csv file, listing the images you would like classified. So in the, uh, the, the uh, GitHub repo and in the Dropbox, I've got uh, an example CSV file. So it's, it's a list of images and just a list of the file names, and semicolons. Okay, so that's easy peasy, hopefully. Uh, so the thing to do is to log into the Zooniverse platform and scroll to the bottom and click on build a project, okay? And then uh, select create a new project. Okay, so it's just the link at the bottom. Now, yeah, doing this live, I, I'm always terrified of uh, internet links and everything goofing up. Uh, so what I did, to uh, prepare for today was to uh, record me doing it live. So I have something, and I still managed to goof it up, but I, I will show you, I will show you what I did. Okay. Um, let's see if this works. Now, is this working? Can anyone hear things? No. In the workshop doesn't work out, uh, so I've got a working demo for you. So I'm going to try and do all of this in real time with no mistakes. What could possibly go wrong? So what I've done is logged into the Zooniverse site here. So this is what it looks like once I've logged in. And I scroll down to the bottom and I click on 
build a project. So I do that. And now I want to do create a new project. Hoping people so can hear this online. Create a new project. And so uh, it asks you for a project name and I'll say this is, well, we need a nice, a nice name for this. Uh, Muffin Magic Mystery, for example. And the short description is, well, it's a demonstration project, a, a project but I will say something like, uh, uh, can we uncover uh, where the muffins are and where the dogs are? And a more in-depth introduction to the science would, can be something like, uh, well, this is a standard machine learning uh, test data set. Um, but we are using it for uh, Zooniverse demonstration. Create project. Boom, there we are. Now, um, we will need to uh, put an avatar and a background image in to this project. So if we do view project at the beginning, you will see that there's really not very much in this at the moment. So we'll start with just a background image and an avatar. Now I have here the Dropbox with the, uh, the images we would like to classify and the background image. So I will just pick one of them for uh, the avatar and one of them for the background. Um, for some reason on my browser, uh, the dragging and dropping doesn't work terribly well or terribly reliably. So I will just do it like this uh, by clicking on it and selecting them. And I now click on it and select the background. And that will hopefully, uh, once it's had time to ingest this, uh, put that into the uh, project. The next thing to do would be to put in the data sets that we need to classify. So that means going into subject sets down here. So we click on subject sets and we will create a new subject set. This we will call uh, muffin or dog data, for example. And here we want to drag and drop the, um, uh, the data. Now note that there has to be a manifest file, which is either a .csv or a .tsv file. Uh, there's instructions here for what it should uh, include. Uh, and let's see if I can show you the manifest file. So this is the manifest file that I've created. It's just a CSV file. It says image at the top says what the image is. So that it's containing images and it's a list of the images. Okay. So what I do is I take that manifest and all of the images, and I drag it into here, and upload 16 new subjects. Chug, 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 chug. You can do this um, from the command line in Python, but I think it's useful to just do it by hand first before you use uh, the uh, Python shortcuts. So we have now uh, uploaded 16 images to classify to see whether they're muffins or chihuahuas. So let's look at one of the images there. Uh, it takes a while, so let's not bother. So, um, so now we are going to go into workflow. So this is the questions that we will be asking the volunteers. So we go into workflows. There are no workflows yet because we haven't uh, defined what the, we want the volunteers to do. So I'll click on new workflow and I will call it I don't know, muffin uh, or dog question. So add that. So uh, so that's the, we put in a title, we need to add the task. We need to define the task for them. So I'll click on add task and in this case it will just be a question. And the question is, uh, is this a muffin or a dog? Okay, we can have some help text here. And go in here. So then we need to define what the answers are. And the answer can be uh, uh, 
it's a muffin. Yummy. And the other answer is it's a doggy. Cute. Um, and note, you can uh, make them sequential if you would like to. So uh, you can go from this question to another question. Uh, this question answer to another task, or you can just submit the classification, then go to the next thing to classify. Um, <laughs> you could allow multiple, so it's both food and puffy. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow that. But I mean that's a, uh, that exists as a possibility. Now there's a nice thing here is that you can enable this uh, some some workflows on the mobile app. They are very uh, uh, simple swipe left, swipe right, binary classifications. Um, so we could, if we like, enable this on the mo mobile app. There are lots of other possible um, options, but we will just keep this one simple for now. So let's test this workflow. Ah, something went wrong. No subject set is associated with this workflow. I haven't told it what I'm classifying yet. Disaster. Well, let's, so now let's define the subject set. Here we are. Uh, so we're going to use the muffin or dog data. There we are. So you can up, uh, have lots of different data sets, uh, but we uh, have only just uploaded one data set here. So now let's test this workflow. Is this a muffin or a dog? It's a muffin. Done. Next. Is this a muffin or a dog? It's another muffin. Need some help with this task. And that's where the help text go. Done. Um, and this one's another muffin. Okay. And let's, let's just say this one's a dog. Let's say it works. Okay. There we go. All right. So the workflow works. Um, we have other things that we can put in. So we need to define uh, the, the, uh, the research and list the team. Uh, there's a talk page for um, uh, the volunteers to discuss things with the uh, uh, science scientists running the project, I would absolutely recommend you do this. You're going to get much better engagement in your citizen science project if you're engaging with the volunteers. And there are lots of other things here that I probably don't need to go into just for, the, for this demo. Uh, so we have at the moment now a working project. It's really easy to get to get uh, citizen science projects up and running and it's now over to you i would i would say this is an easier technology to to work than a, a wiki i think it's pretty intuitive and it's a very useful way of pulling in thousands or tens of thousands of volunteers to your uh, data mining problem So even though I recorded it, I still managed to goof it up at one point. <laughs> so, um, so uh, how many people here are having a go at building something? Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. Um, so we've got 15 minutes left. I've got uh, James Pearson uh, is online who can uh, answer questions on um, uh, any, uh, if, you, if you're getting into any problems setting up a, a project. Can I ask what the, what the projects are about? Yeah. User evaluation. User evaluation. Cool, cool, cool. Galaxy classification. Excellent, very good use case. Anyone else? Quantification, so comparing sound. Uh, 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 and, uh, how, uh, sorry, maybe you should say it into the microphone because it was really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Our research is uh, based on um, sonification of spectra, stellar spectra. So 
Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe we can, uh, we're interested in if uh, people can classify spectra just by hearing. That's really interesting. And probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I, I think they can. Um, there's, there's a limited capability. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've just seen yeah. that uh, you can uh, introduce MP3 yeah. and yeah, yeah. MP4 also. Yeah. It, it works for video also. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, cool. it's, it's possible. I mean, you can't do all of the things that you might imagine you can possibly do with uh, uh, annotating videos, and, uh, but but it's, it, yeah, it's certainly yeah. supported, yeah. yeah. Very interesting, yeah. yeah. Thanks so much. Cool, cool, cool. James, just say that, as you say, if anyone online has any query about setting up a project on the universe, he's happy to help. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so uh, one of the reasons that I want I I <laughs> dragged James into into participating in the workshop is that he's got a lot of experience with uh, 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 setting up these sorts of projects, and so if you would like to get something up and running, then uh, uh, he's really got a lot of expertise that can um, be deployed to help you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so in the demo uh, the recording that you mm -hmm. showed, you uh, you saved the project, but you didn't publish it, right? I saved it and I didn't publish it. Yeah, exactly. there is a box so, to, to, to make it public. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the moment you publish it, then anyone uh, that goes to Zooniverse will see it? Uh, yes, it will, it will exist on the Zooniverse platform. Mm -hmm. But that in itself would not make it an official Zooniverse exactly. project. Yeah, yes, yeah. We, we, and part uh, where you would search through the Zooniverse official projects and say, well, I'm interested in biology. I really want to find about ants. So let's do a project on ants. Um, uh, so yes, it wouldn't be findable through that. But yes, it would be public and you could you could uh, publicize it yourself. Um, you yeah. the URL, right? You'd have the URL. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. We have a question. It's a question on Zoom. From Mortis. From Mortis. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for interesting uh, talk. Uh, I, I have a question. I, I'm working in this uh, Lofar uh, cosmology group, and uh, we have uh, we we had and uh, we had a project in this uh, zoo universe. It was Lofar Galaxy Zoo, and it's uh, finished recently. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, in these uh, galaxies, was the, the the problem is that the people uh, normally uh, uh, classify the same spots, and they want to just to play with these things, and they don't to care about these things. Uh, exactly what I think what what happened in our uh, project as well. So, uh, do you think uh, uh, how could we? Um, uh, the make is not a good word, but make people to uh, to read the tutorial and do the the things right, not not to uh, go just play with these things or 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 or, or another, another solutions to um, find out the false classification or something like that. Because in these galaxy zoos, it's it's the normal thing here. It's a really good question, and um, I. When I was looking for the examples of citizen science projects to show, I was aware of the Radio Galaxy Zoo LOFAR. Um, and I thought, well, I could highlight that one, but there is a very significant non-zero probability that there will be someone in the audience who is already engaged and probably active in that exact project. So I would be trying to teach them something about you know, where they are already the experts. So I thought it was probably a, a risky idea. Um, it's a really interesting project, Radio Galaxy Zoo Lo-Fi. If I'm remembering rightly, it's asking people to identify the uh, uh, the optical IDs of radio galaxies, and you you know it's a slightly nebulous question where you've got uh, two radio lobes and you're looking for the uh, the ID that's somewhere in the center. And what is that most likely to be the the ID? Is it a giant elliptical? Is it is it just exactly centered? Blah 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 blah. It's a tricky question and. Uh, um, <laughs> the work and the consequences, the workflow, the, the things you're asking the volunteers to do are pretty complicated. 
So we had an option to highlight, it's so again back to the publicity question, we had an option to highlight a Zooniverse project on a TV programme on, um, uh, it's, uh, UK people will know this name, Brian Cox. Brian Cox is a uh, so UK TV, he's a particle physicist, uh, but he does a lot of TV science shows um, sort of with a soft Mancunian accent pointing into the distance, talking about billions and billions of this. Um, but uh, anyway, he, he yeah, gets millions and millions of viewers. Uh, and we had an option to tag a, a, a citizen science project onto the end of that. And we thought about using Radio Galaxy Zoo Lofar. But the feedback we had from the broadcasting people it was it was too complicated a workflow for engaging a very big audience like that. So we had to pick something a bit simpler. Um, so in terms of uh, how to get, I mean, you, you, coming back to your question of how to how to get volunteers to uh, to do what you want with the data, uh, I would say there is an inverse correlation between. Um, the complexity of the task and the, uh, the, am the amount of volunteer engagement. So uh, you can get volunteers to do lots of complicated things, uh, but the more complicated, the fewer volunteers, but also the higher quality of the work as well. So it, 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 it's a balance. Um, and it's also the first time I've heard that uh, what people were doing in um, Radio Galaxy Zoo Lofar was they just wanted to play with the data. That's that's really interesting. I did not know that. I did not know that. Um, uh, it can work to your advantage if you have a way of volunteers jumping out of the project into something like uh, Aladdin Light and then playing with the data. And because Aladdin Light is a virtual observatory tool, it's very accessible. Um, uh, I've become a bit of an evangelist of Aladdin because I, I got involved with some. Uh, some work at uh, CDS Strasbourg uh, and uh, met the team and yeah, you can do so many things with it and the Aladdin light uh, package is uh, uh, it's, uh, very accessible to uh, to students to, to volunteers so if you're looking if your use case is that you want people to play with the data and look for weird things then uh, you can set up a project to do explicitly that. And you can have people jumping out into, into, uh, 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 into the, the advanced tools, like the virtual observatory tools like Aladdin. Um, if you're trying to prevent people from doing that and you want them just to get on with the thing you've asked them to do, well, it's, that's a difficult balance. It sort of depends on the particular workflow you've got in mind. Um, uh, it's about the design of the experiment. It's about how you guide people through. So it is possible to get people to do complex classifications as we've seen in Galaxy Zoo, but you have to lead them through a very careful chain or a tree of, of simple decisions. And then you sort of nurse them through the process of, 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 uh, of coming up with a complex classification from, a, from the sum of a lot of little simple decisions. So, I would, so my counsel would be to, uh, to guide them through a lot of very simple decisions. That would be how to stop them getting sidetracked. That's, uh, that's the objective. Um, does that answer your question? It might not, personally. Let's go with yes. <laughs> no, sorry, uh, I, I couldn't hear you. What? Oh my God! <laughs> I would say keep it simple. That's the that's the ah, best. Option. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah the, 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 this, uh, one of the things that people uh, uh, thought about is uh, at least uh, each object should be classified by five people. That mm. one to they 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 thought about it and we had uh, one hundred eighty thousand. Uh, objects and uh, the the classification uh, uh, number was um, something one one million. It was uh, each object was classified by by five people at least. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, uh, we should we should think about other <laughs> other ways. Yeah, yeah. Beside these things, yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. You need 
uh, five is quite a low number. 10 is more common uh, for, for Galaxy Zoo, for example, or some of the projects, the other projects I've talked about. Uh, now we've got five minutes left. Um, I have a, a, a demo here of a GitLab uh, workbook. It's a, pre a recorded presentation by James about a, a deploying Python to manage a project. Um, so we could show that, or has anyone, would anyone like to uh, show anything for, that they've created um, uh, on the Zooniverse platform? It would be, be awesome if someone's made a thing and we could, uh, we, we could see it, but uh, I, I'm not going to insist if, 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 if nobody wants to. Oh my goodness, all right. <laughs> okay. Okay, we'll help you, or James will help you with the manifest file. That's uh, if that was the problem. Yeah. What, what, what's the content of the manifest? Because the one you showed uh, included just the the, the yeah. list of names, but yeah. the, the description was saying that the, the, there could images. be more columns, right? Yeah. So, what is the additional information that could go inside this file? Uh, I don't know. Actually, the the the, the, the full range of things. I've only used it for simple into uh, simple things like. Uh, a list of images. I don't know, James, is, do you know what else can go in a manifest file? Uh, so I think, firstly, technically, I don't think you need a manifest file if you've just, okay. just got very simple things. Okay. Um, a manifest file, you can include any sort of extra metadata that can either, either you want it hidden from the public view, you just want it associated with that particular subject. For example, an ID that you can reference later in your research. Um, you can also include um uh metadata that you might want volunteers to see for example in galaxy zoo we often give the coordinates make them public so volunteers can go and go away and look at the galaxies in other surveys um you can also use the manifest file uh to if you have a subject that might consist of multiple images that you want volunteers to flick between uh the way to do that is to use it's basically a manifest file where on one line you have the two image names on that same line. And that will mean when you upload the manifest file, it will associate those two images as a single subject. I think those are the main uses of the manifest file. If if there's no metadata you need at all, or there's no complicated subjects, uh, for now, at least for, for the, just sort of a sample creating a project, I don't think you need a manifest file. Um, you, you were saying before about Aladdin. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any way of connecting Galaxy Zoo, for example, with a, a Aladdin in Light or other VO tool instead of uploading the data? Maybe through the manifest, for, for example, providing the URL to the image or something like that? The, the way it's done at the moment is people jump out of the Zooniverse project. Now, um, it's been an aspiration to uh, of mine to, for, for the Zooniverse to embed Aladdin Light. Um, so then you would have the whole functionality of uh, uh, of Aladdin in the Zooniverse project. But there are technical reasons for why this is a very difficult problem to. Uh, uh, it's something about the Panoptes client being written in Ruby. Uh, while Aladdin Light is, is, a, is a JavaScript, and for some reason, it's just the interoperability is terrible, and it would just would not work. Um, so, yeah, that would be great, but we can't. It can't be done at the moment. Yeah. Um, one more question, if I may. Um, I think this could be interesting for some people. So, I, I, I guess I, I once saw that uh, some people in, in the Netherlands they were using Galaxy Zoo like a closed project for doing science, so not, not citizen science, just mm -hmm. science between the, the astronomers. So yeah. can, can you comment on that maybe? Yeah, in fact, it's not just those. Uh, I, I've known um, the Euclid Consortium. So uh, Euclid uh, Optical Infrared Space Telescope being launched in June, July this year, roughly. Uh, there is an internal private project to classify simulated Euclid images and get galaxy morphologies um, uh, 
for the purposes of uh, 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 creating labels for machine learning, for example. Um, so uh, this was run privately uh, within the consortium. So the link existed, but it was not made public. Uh, and yeah, and uh, you needed to log in and, and be authorized to access the data uh, on the Zooniverse platform. It's a really useful use case. I've, I've seen the um, uh, uh, the manga team did something similar when they were interrogating the potential targets. So, so in yeah. principle, any in, anyone could do that. Anyone could do that. Yeah, yeah. So There's... no, no privileges that are special privileges are needed for for setting up a private project. There's there are no privileges for setting up a permanent project. You uh, just need to create a Zooniverse login for yourself. Yeah. Is there any volume limit? Yes, there is. Um, you can't upload the uh, 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 exabytes of SKA data. <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> I don't know what the limit is, um, but uh, yeah, if you don't do something insane, then it won't break. <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, 10,000 subjects you can upload before you need to contact the Zooniverse team for more allowance. <laughs> there's, still, there's still plenty of data for most people. <laughs> we have a very, very practical question. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can talk about it during the coffee. Mm -hmm. Is uh, we, we have learned how to create a workflow, but I was trying to search how you can get the, the result of the of the work, the the answer of the the of the user the volunteers mm -hmm. i um but i i think i just have found so you can request no the uh, these answers from the yeah. but it's not automatic you you send like a request and you will receive an email with the data is that so actually james has just done this uh with uh, galaxy Zoo cosmic dawn and it can be done uh from python so i don't know james do you want to comment on that uh it can do oh. And make wrong. Uh, so yes, yeah, so Zooniverse, you can on the web builder, you can click that you want to export your data, whether that's uh, sort of metadata on the subjects and sort of the number of classifications that each subject have had, or uh, the actual classification data itself. Um, and then so you'll get an email notification when that data is ready to collect. You can download it, um, and then you can. Uh, and so they don't once it's ready, the data can be downloaded manually, like through the email link, or using the uh, Python package that Zooniverse has. Uh, and then you can use some Python code, for example, to uh, reformat the data in whatever way you need to to do your research. <laughs> and I will put a link to uh, GitLab. Uh for uh, some uh, example work, Python notebook workflows that uh, uh, James has written for uh, managing uh, Zooniverse projects from within Python and also uh, automatically retiring subjects when they've been sufficiently classified and integrating machine learning as well. Good thing you mentioned coffee, uh, coffee Susanna, because it's almost coffee time. But let's take one final quick question, Anthony, and then we reconvene at 11.30 later. Yeah. All right. So my question is going to be provocative as okay. well. <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. And I'm surprised that nobody thought about this, but you can study a lot of things, mm -hmm. like you can study physical objects, but mm -hmm. also you can study like human behavior. Mm. And I'm surprised no nobody mentioned this, but uh, I was wondering, like, does the universe also consider the ethical issues that is related about like psychological experiments that declare themselves as psychological experiments and some that do not. And then they would like put some things to classify and then they retrieve data that is not related to the classification, but to like um, some, some, some human response. So I was just thinking about your Chihuahua yeah. situation because they were just uh, muffins popping up. I thought like a um, kind of silly human experiment would be have only a database of muffins and see until what point does one stick to <laughs> <laughs> classifying it as a muffin and then says, okay, this data is, is crap, so I'll just mess around, you know. So I was just thinking, are there any uh, projects that are hosted like this on Zooniverse? And 
Yeah, yeah. You could comment about this. I, I really like your idea. It's a, a, a sort of a surreptitious secret social sciences human behavior experiment. Just giving people garbage until, <laughs> until they break. <laughs> I love it. So um, there, uh, there are ethical frameworks. I mean, the ethics of uh, running projects with the public is not something that uh, in astronomy we, we generally have to worry about. Um, uh, there are there are uh, ethic an ethic there is an ethical framework uh, uh, policy in uh, Zooniverse for uh, the use of the data that is submitted. Um, uh, however, if you're running a, an experiment about humans and you're working in a university, uh, you still need to go through the uh, uh the ethical review processes of your university and having a zooniverse platform with its own policies doesn't exempt a person from having to go through that uh, uh in terms of characterizing volunteers part of the normal practice in astronomy is to classify the volunteer uh accuracy uh the, you know, the, the, the precision and the recall of the volunteers in the, in the classification task. Uh, so when you're aggregating the data, you're, classify, you're, you're, you're trying to identify which are the things that are in common through the volunteers and which are, a vol and, uh, whether a volunteer is frequently uh, away from the, the consensus or, or towards it. And, um, uh, and that's done algorithmically. It's done behind the scenes. It's done without uh, letting any volunteers know uh, where they are. Uh, and the volunteers themselves are anonymous. Uh, and so uh, that simplifies the, uh, uh, the, uh, the ethical use case, at least in the, in, the, in the situation in astronomy. But yeah, really interesting. I love that idea. <laughs> when are they going to break? Oh, my God. <laughs> The users. That's what I mm. I said. User evaluation because you need to know some background on the user. Uh, yeah. So how so universe tackles this question? So uh, uh, the universe does not keep uh, demographic. It doesn't store any dem demographic information about the volunteers. So if you need it for your science use case. Uh, you would need to ask it somehow in in the in the workflows. So uh, yeah, it would need to be designed in, and uh, and it hasn't even occurred to me for, 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 for uh, what whether that would need an ethical review. Probably not. It depends what you're asking. It depends what you're asking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. There's GDPR for that. Yeah. So if you're asking a person's age, for example, yeah, yeah, indeed. Okay. 